Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar, which is part of a series of webinars that GATE will be hosting throughout this year that will all be dedicated to anti-gender opposition to trans and gender diverse and wider LGBTQI communities. Um, so basically the idea of this webinar is to discuss um, what is the what does the anti-gender opposition look like in different regions and we have participants from different parts of the world who will be discussing um, the situation in their own contexts and the idea is for our viewers to be equipped with information and see similarities as well as differences between how anti-gender groups mobilize and attack trans and gender diverse groups in, in different regions, as well as see similarities and differences between how transgender diverse and wider LGBTQI communities respond to these attacks and, and the wider opposition. Um, we, I would like to thank our participants and the organizations that allowed us to create this webinar. This is RFSL, Pan-Africa ILGA, uh, El La Para Trans Latinas, and UC Trans. All of these organizations, a huge portion of their work is regional, which means that they're in a continuous conversation with activists in their own respective regions. And they're best positioned to give us an overview of what's happening in their contexts. Um, so I'm going to start with, I think, Natia, which is um, based in Sweden and um, in Europe because um, our analysis shows that basically um, anti-gender moves are very highly concentrated in the global north. So I wanted to start with you. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers to you. So Natia is um, an advocacy program manager at RFSL Sweden. Um, she currently works on coordinating advocacy efforts of a coalition of organizations from Eastern Europe focusing among other things on the subject of anti-gender mobilization. Additionally, Natia has more than 10 years of leadership experience in the Georgian LGBT movement, where she actively engaged in community mobilization, research, advocacy, and increasing uh, positive visibility of SOGI issues in the society. Natia holds two MA degrees in gender studies and global politics. So I'm going to basically ask similar questions to all of our panelists so that our viewers can see similarities and differences between these regions. So Natia, um, can you please give us a brief overview of what the nature of anti-gender mobilizing against LGBTQI communities in Europe looks like? Who are the main actors? And also where do they get their financial, ideological and political support from? Uh, thank you very much, Levan, for the introduction. And also thank you for, for inviting me uh, to, to speak at this webinar. Uh, I'll start out by saying that I'm absolutely honored and very excited to be here with you in, uh, you know, surrounded by amazing activists and I'm really looking forward to learning a lot from, from what you have to say uh, today. Um, to uh, to uh, clarify a little bit, so the, the, the program that we have in, in Eastern Europe is specifically focused, focused on Eastern partnership countries um, and also some cooperation with Russian um, LGBTQI movement, um, and we work primarily with Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia, uh, Georgia, um, and I'm, I also mentioned uh, uh, that we have some uh, some cooperation and contact with uh, with activists uh, from Russia. Um, we work with a coalition of organizations from from these countries. They are main, uh, mainly um, umbrella LGBT organizations uh, in 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 each country, but. Uh, each of them also very closely cooperates with trans activists um, um, locally and nationally, and have also been engaged in advocacy related, for example, uh, to uh, legal gender recognition procedures, trans specific healthcare, et cetera. So, so we, we do get, uh, we, we do also have contacts with, with other groups uh, on the ground. Uh, in 2019, we decided together with this coalition, uh, which is the Eastern European Coalition for LGBT plus equality, to do a mapping of the anti-gender groups um, in these countries. And in this mapping, we also included 
uh, Belarus and Azerbaijan, which is not represented in the coalition because we wanted to, to cover in, uh, the, the whole um, Eastern partnership and uh, also like see what's happening in Russia and sort of to be able to compare the trends. Um, what we came to was that um, there is a mosaic or, you know, if you will, a puzzle of um, uh, groups that are opposed to the feminist women right, women's rights movements broadly and also LGBTQI movements. Uh, uh, they have sort of a similar modus operandi, uh, while the entry points may be different. Uh, these groups range from uh, political parties and specific politicians to um, clergy and, um, you know, official representatives of different religious institutions, uh, especially the dominant, uh, dominant religious institutions, uh, which, for example, is the Christian Orthodox Church is one of the biggest ones in, um, in the region. Um, and uh, uh, then, you know, it goes down to more violent and militant uh, far right groups, which are not represented everywhere. And I will explain very shortly about that. Uh, but there is a larger share of the so-called conservative civil society that is oriented at, um, I guess, advocating against um, uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, uh, and also, of course, always advocates against uh, any sort of progress and any sort of improvements um, in the rights of uh, LGBTQI people. For far-right groups that are more violent, we noticed a bit of a difference uh, between the states that are more authoritarian and a little less authoritarian. So the states such as Belarus, Azerbaijan, and Russia uh, they maintain a monopoly on, on violence and repression, basically, which means that uh, any type of uh, far-right groups, for example, that are anti-establishment, are treated more or less the same as, you know, the NGOs and civil society that criticize the state. Um, and there are very strict um, anti-extremist laws. So basically, all these uh, far-right movements are also sort of quashed and, you know, uh, driven underground doesn't mean that they don't exist, but I mean, their influence is not as big. On the other hand, in Russia, we also observed the birth of uh, another strata of violent vigilantes that, uh, and these are people that align themselves with the state policy. So for if we talk about foreign agents laws, anti-propaganda laws, et cetera, and take it upon themselves to uh, help the state, so, so to speak, implement these laws. So this means that they will attack people, they will report on people, et cetera. And this, this goes for, for LGBTQI people as a spectrum. Um, to focus a little more specifically on anti-trans um, tendencies, what we saw was that there is no such pronounced mobilizing of the uh, groups that, you know, uh, position as feminist, but are very exclusive of, you know, trans non-binary gender diverse people. There are some uh, outspoken individuals and maybe smaller groups uh, that we used to see in Russia and Ukraine, maybe a couple in Moldova, but as it, it hasn't been present as a tendency. Uh, but it, of course, doesn't mean that, you know, anti-gender movements in general are, you know, for some weird reason, very friendly to, to trans people. That's absolutely not true. So any type of, you know, reform that also includes trans people has, uh, um, has been uh, targeted by, by, by these groups uh, in, an, in a negative sense. Um, what we've been noticing uh, recently um, uh, in countries such as Georgia, for example, is, however, that the ongoing discussions that come from, uh, you know, the media reporting on what is happening in the US and the UK with, you know, the, 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 the schools, but also like the participation of trans people and trans youth in sports, for example, as well as uh, all the discussions around like, JK Rowling and her transphobic statements, uh, that has been seeping into the discourse and discussions of, you know, more middle-class liberal, people that, you know, position themselves also as feminists and, you know, overall supporting LGBTQI rights. Um, and we've been seeing increasing discussions where, you know, trans people, their identities, you know, the legitimacy of the claim to be able to participate in sports, have access to some spaces, have been questioned more and more. So I'm afraid we will be seeing a little more um, effects uh, of, of this, uh, unfortunately. Um, 
yeah, I think I'll stop here for now. As for influences very, very shortly and, and uh, uh, funding, uh, most of the anti-gender groups that we deal with in the region are not super transparent about where they get their support. Uh, in some, some cases, you can trace some money back to, to Russia because uh, it has been you know, uh, proven that Russia has been supporting far-right movements also in Europe, in Western Europe, among other things, and not only. And there is also a big interest that we see from international uh, and US-based groups, uh, such as National Organization for Marriage and their World Congress of Families has been very present in the region. And this has been rather unfortunate. So there's, um, there's a, a lot of lack of transparency, but also some things can be traced back to very specific sources and especially rich sort of people, oligarchs and rich businessmen that, businessmen that hold these uh, same values and want to you know, support this type of uh, organizing, so to speak. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Natia, very much. I forgot to mention to our viewers that towards the end, we will have some time dedicated to Q&A. So you're welcome to post your questions to the Q&A section. And towards the end, we'll have our panelists share their answers um, to your questions. The second question that I wanted to ask you, Natia, is about, so what, in your work, what do you see as the main tactics used by these anti-gender groups to attack trans and gender diverse and wider LGBTQI rights and, and people? Um, sorry for the people noise, my coffee maker. <laughs> um, the main, the tactics, they also vary from group to group, depending, you know, what the specific group does. Yeah, when it comes to more militant far right groups, uh, what we've seen is that typically they do uh, protests uh, or they, you know, attack some people, and but they also work on recruiting youth. So they try to capitalize on frustration that uh, uh, may be there among, you know, young people, especially in different, you know, uh, in specific social social strata, because. Uh, all the countries in Eastern partnership, uh, are, they're not like, we're not rich countries. And, you know, there's a lot of social and economic uh, inequality. Um, and the leaders of this group are very um, adept at, uh, you know, manipulating um, this. Uh, so there will be always comparisons of, you know, if you have like one reform in every 10 years that is inclusive of LGBT uh, I people or LGBT people even, I mean, um, uh, intersex uh, organizing and uh, uh, attention to intersex uh, people and rights is very low uh, across the region, um, especially in some countries. Uh, but I mean, if you have like one reform for 10 years, they will blow it out of proportion and say that, you know, the government cares more about these groups than, you know, about you poor people. And, you know, it's disregarded that queer people uh, are very poor we're very poor ourselves <laughs> and you know there's a reason for that so there's one tactic uh, they also spread a lot of false information and so you have to be constantly in this like fact check uh, sort of mode uh, which uh, most of the general public doesn't do um, so they man manipulate the discourse manipulate uh, different issues around LGBTQI uh, rights, um, they create an illusion, that's very important, they create an illusion of, uh, of a movement, of a bigger movement. Uh, if When it comes down to it, these groups may not be that numerous or that influential either, but they're very good at creating an illusion that they have this huge following and that they represent, you know, the people and the people's will. Uh, which is very dangerous. Um, they also often have political ambitions. I mean, we've seen both uh, in, in Ukraine historically, but also in, recently in Georgia and Armenia as well, that some of the far right groups registered as political parties. And, you know, uh, there's this increasing sort of will of getting into like power structures and being able to, to control uh, a little more what's happening. Um, and yeah, they participate in, inter in international sort of mobilization through events such as World Congress of Family. So this is this is more or less that they manipulate a lot of discourses, especially around you know children's rights, um, uh, around this like division between the traditional values versus uh, Western values. So wherever they can capitalize, they they manipulate it every single time. 
Um, and so in, in, in the face of these attacks, um, what are the, some of the tactics that um, trans and gender diverse and wider LGBTQI community has used throughout their work to address this opposition basically? And can you also give us a brief overview of what activists in that region and also you think that that has worked and has not worked? Um, th that is still a question that has a lot of question marks. Um, I think that especially considering the situation right now with, uh, with the war in Ukraine, um, um, a lot of the things will, will, will be different and will be much harder. So far, um, I think especially in the last five years, first of all, what's been working is um, a lot of organizations have been doing mapping and research and trying to trace the money and trying to very uh, clearly trace some of the tactics that these groups are using. And this has been working in a sense that uh, organizations then built their own communication strategies or their own programs uh, around, you know, if not to directly responding to this, uh, like indirectly working against it. Um, and what has been very important for, for example, donor organizations, intermediary organizations to understand also in light of this growing opposition is that, you know, providing flexible support to organizations, to groups, uh, smaller groups, bigger groups, you know, you name it, uh, is a crucial issue for adaptability and, and ability to actually respond to some trends uh, and not being locked within the frame of, for example, a project that cannot be budged. So this has been a very important part of the discussion uh, that has been driven in, you know, to some extent, at least to a successful level, because I think that, the, you know, the, the availability of flexible support is growing. And also from what we've seen in the research, uh, the, the support to the groups that have, have been underrepresented and, you know, more marginalized have been on the receiving end of a lot of violence and also in some countries are more also uh, prone to be attacked by, uh, by, by, by some of these groups. And this includes, you know, trans uh, uh, movements, trans activists, um, that support has also been growing. And I mean, there's a lot more to be done, but that is a positive development in, in my opinion. And this, uh, I mean, it's not a tactic of the organizations per se, but it's the ask that, you know, is finally being take, taken seriously. And it can help organizations be resilient and build this resilience. Um, yeah, people have also been, you know, actively working on doc documenting hate crimes and, you know, pointing out who the perpetrators are and trying to create some visibility around it and, you know, be, be very outspoken and also build alliances with, with different groups, especially emphasizing alliances between, you know, LGBTQI movements and, you know, feminist movements has been very important in the region to also not let, you know, this like uh, so-called feminism, which is exclusive and transphobic, take root, uh, I think, in a preventive manner. Um, recently, in the discussions that I mentioned that, you know, focus on, um, you know, sort of like a, a questioning, uh, questioning access of trans people to some spaces, etc., that stem from, from these like in, internationally discussed uh, uh, sort of developments. There I've seen some Georgian activists, for example, engage in trying to inform people why this is not correct and you know what is actually happening. So I think that that will be built on a little more because I think we will need to be, you know, work in a preventive manner on awareness raising before these discourses actually take root. Um, and um, uh, visibility campaigns that have been done by organizations increasingly focusing on changing public opinions that has also been a response to the far right groups because you need to you know gain sort of more supporters or at least you know more neutrality from from some strata of the society so that has been another thought it's a little hard to say what's been working and what's not because it, in the um social like change in public opinion takes time um, and what uh, is a major obstacle for, for a lot of us and for a lot of activists on the ground is lack of political will, for the most part, to engage in, you know, proactive reform or actually, you know, make statements condemning violence or actually properly investigate some cases. So in a short run, in, in a short term perspective, you know, the effects are few, the positive effects are few, because that would require the state to actually be engaged. 
uh, but the state often uh, in, in different countries often manipulates with, with, with these groups, uh, also the violent groups and uses them uh, for their own interests. So that's a major obstacle. Um, but you, I, I think that building resilience, building you know new type of uh, visibility campaigns, and also like research and fact checking, that has also been and building alliances has also been very important in the sense. Um, thank you, Natia. And can you also like briefly, like for like one or two minutes, just very briefly, also speak to how the situation is changing in this in the recent past, and what do you see as the main challenges and opportunities in the nearest future to continue activism in this field? Yeah, the challenges are many. I'll try to be brief. Um, again, I um, I will repeat that uh, uh, specifically for trans non-binary gender diverse uh, uh, people and you know groups working in different countries. The challenge right now is uh, you know increasing uh, sort of international discussions on developments in different countries, including the countries that typically position themselves as you know this beacon of equality and. Uh, yeah, I mean, Sweden as well. Sweden, unfortunately, uh, does have really outspoken uh, groups that position themselves as fem feminist, but are very transphobic. And they have been, you know, po pausing the, the development when it comes to legal gender recognition law and improvements in it uh, for quite some time. And, you know, the same discussions that come out from the UK, the US, etc., they cause a lot of traction, especially in people who are on Facebook, which is again, you know, mostly middle class, more like liberal, that people that position themselves as typically pro-human rights, uh, but they have questions. So I think that is something that we should not, um, uh, we should not feel that it, like it's like it will blow over. I think that the proactive engagement needs to, to, to happen there so, so that these you know, uh, opinions do not actually take root because so far, mostly there has been quite a good cooperation between different trans groups and, you know, women's rights groups. Uh, and I think Georgia is one of the examples of it, but I mean, this has been happening also in other countries that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we want to keep it that way as much as possible, right? Um, yeah. Another major challenge, very, very quickly, the war in Ukraine. Nationalism and militarism is on the rise, not just in Ukraine, obvious for obvious reasons, but also across the region. And the dividing line right now lies not so much on, you know, whether or not a person is violently nationalist, but whether or not you support Kremlin, which partially is fair, but in, in the longer run, it will cause, again, you know, uh, more mobilization of far right groups, more normalization of opinions that are exclusionary of specific groups uh, of people in the society. Um, so it is unclear how we're going to deal with this yet because the situation is still unfolding, but it's a very important um, uh, obstacle and especially for Ukraine where Russia has twisted this discourse of sort of denazifying Ukraine which, uh, which also led to, for example, some of the far right groups saying that, you know, all those LGBTQ activists that were trying to speak out against far right violence were actually driving, you know, Russia's agenda. So this has been twisted and it will just, you know, create more obstacles uh, for people to speak yeah. out against it. Thank you. Sorry for taking more time. No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Natia. So now I'm going to move to Jaja who is a trans woman and activist who has been at the forefront of fighting for the rights of trans and gender diverse people in Gauteng. Um, she's a human rights and free access to healthcare activist uh, for all. Um, no, sorry, um, um, human rights and free access to healthcare for all is her motto. Jaja supports the visibility of trans and gender diverse people and believes their existence needs to be acknowledged and respected. So, um, Jaja, I'm going to start with uh, with question with exactly same questions to you. So, what do you see as the, the, the what is the nature of anti gender opposition in African region? Who are the main actors, and where do they get their support, ideological, financial, political support from? Hi, good afternoon, Levan. Um, so, for Africa and it is quite different in the way the anti-gender movement is working. And that is solely because um, anti-gender movement 
is more of a very westernized and a European kind of imperialism word that's being used. Um, and more um, on the African continent, there seems to be more of a pro-family value that's being discussed. Um, so that is what's basically being used on the African continent. Um, when we look at the anti-LGBTI movement in Africa, we find that a lot of the, that the, most of the times, the words that come up is pro-family, family values. If we look at the Ghana uh, family values bill that was also um, posed, not so long, last year sometime, it speaks more about the family values and how they believe that the nuclear family is the only way. And when we look at the history of the of the African continent, we uh, if, if we go back pre colonial times, there was never discussions about genderism, there was never discussions about male, female, and how we lived on the African continent. And if we look at history and how history has discussed um, how a lot of Europeans and Westernized and Western people that came onto the African continent and what they saw in Africa, it is discussed just same-sex relationships that happened on the African continent. And so this in itself speaks volumes about how Africanism has been colonialized centuries ago. And because of this colonialism, it has affected our lives today and how we live. Um, so it's a, it's a very, really, and if we look again at the history of like, for instance, where this comes from, it is more from a, from a religious, background that we are starting to face these challenges on the African continent. If we look at, excuse me, um, the organizations mostly imposing these kinds of challenges uh, against LGBTI members, it is mostly from religious views. Um, and, and I think the, the, the fear is that they, they do not see us first and foremost as human, as human beings, but they see our sexual orientation, they see our gender identities as, an, as, a, as a factor that they, that instills fear into them and which they feel would basically ruin what a nuclear family's belief is in society. And um, I think the other thing that we need to understand is that people do not want to accept the fact that gender has been a social construct from the get go. And so because of that and having this being installed for centuries, you know, including the whole hierarchical and a very um, political movement, um, it's basically looking at how to basically maintain a family value, which is nuclear. And these are basically things that we need to start looking into as to how could we eradicate it. Um, some of the main actors, especially from an African perspective, is very westernized, very Europeanized, because if we look at where the, the, the support comes from, um, we've got organizations like the Family Watch, you know, Family Watch Institute that comes in. We've got an organization based in South Africa, which is the Family Policy Institute. And so they've been getting a lot of support. It may not be necessarily very financial, but just the work of, again, just looking at westernization and the implications that comes from western lifestyles being brought and still being in, installed on the african continent shows that there is so very much a colonial mentality on the african continent and what our african people do not understand is that this is how they are being brainwashed into believing that this is the that this is the way this is the truth you know and so i, I for, for me the, these are the kinds of actors that we need to start addressing in terms of how do we basically eradicate this colonialist 
mentality on the African continent and bring back the Africanism. Because for me, I believe that these actors that come from the Western and the European uh, regions are, 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 are basically doing this solely because there is some sort of gain for them in some way because for me the only question is why would you have or why would you be coming on board with these kinds of issues that have got nothing to do with you in your personal life and bringing it to a different continent so it is very important that you know for, for me is that these are people who have definitely benefited from colonialism and wants to see this through yeah, Zsa, Zsa, uh, can you also um, briefly talk about some of the main tactics that these groups are using against trans and gender diverse people? Um, yeah, so <laughs> most of the tactics being used is the misconstruing of information. I think if we look at the LGBTI community, we've always still are a minority globally. And I think what we're basically fighting for as a, an LGBTI community is not specific to LGBTI rights, but our human rights as a community, you know, and so I think the importance of that needs to be to, to be highlighted. And whereas the tactics used by these anti-gender uh, anti movements is that is, is the terms that they use in terms of us recruiting their children, um, us wanting their children to be part of the community. Um, so um, as Natia mentioned, yes, there's a lot of protests that happen. There's a lot of discussions. Um, and I think what happens is that our, our there's never a separation between church and state when it comes to countries and continents, because when we look at how politics works, there's always a, a, a religious movement that is either agreeing or disagreeing with what happens. And in doing so, we're basically saying that we do not want democracy. And that seems to be the norm for religious people because our belief globally is that we want a democratic world. We want people to be free free of their minds, bodies, and souls to do what they and how they should live. And so these are the kinds of tactics that they use to say that if we give them their freedom to do whatever they want to, they will instill this uh, into our children. They're going to recruit our children. And I mean, the derogatory part of all of this is that we as LGBTI people are seen as pedophiles. And so this brings such a, a bad uh, you know, no picture to the community in general. Uh, so, for, you know, so so these are the kinds of tactics that's being used. Um, they're using tactics of getting to parents and teachers and saying to them that, you know, we, we need to stop this now because you've got to think of your child and think of your child's future. Um, you know, so these are the thing. One of the other most important things that, um, which was also brought around uh, about with the COVID-19 pandemic is that a lot of the issues in the world are caused by the LGBTI. This is such a hogwash. And I know that even recently on the African continent, it was discussed that, oh, it's because of the, it's because of the LGBTI community that COVID-19 pandemic is here. So these are the kinds of myths that are construed or, or put out there against our community. And these tactics are used against people that do not have knowledge, who have not, you know, do not have experience of knowing the LGBTI community and knowing what our true fight is for our community. Um, thank you, Georgia, for this. And can you also speak about, in your work, like what have you observed in terms of how LGBTQI and trans and gender diverse communities are resisting this opposition? What do we have any success stories? And also, do we have any criticism of what has not worked in, in past? Um, so, so, you know, this, the, the, this, uh, I think Mattia mentioned this as well in terms of, you know, like how uh, um, the, 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 the resistance from the, against anti gender attacks is that 
um, we're, we're trying our level best to honestly just make means for our community to get what belongs to them rightfully. And that is our human rights value because that is the most important thing that we all need to, 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 to fight for, to believe in. And so I know that um, there's been a lot of good movement, um, including Botswana, um, where we've basically had the, um, the law uh, overturned in terms of the anti-gender um, in, in, in Botswana. So there is there is a bit of the wheels are turning, they are turning slow, but I do believe that the challenges we have is is getting past the patriarchal, the past the Africanism and also past tribalism in Africa, because you know, tribalism plays such a major role in in, in progress on the continent because you know it's also being um installed with the whole religious belief tribalism um on the continent um sort of organizations out there on the continent that are basically working to 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 to, to fighting our values uh, and the true meaning of why we exist and how we exist. And I think we, 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 we need to, inc to be more inclusive of expressing what our true purpose is um, as an LGBTI community and look beyond the whole gender ideology that people have perceived of us. Thank you, Jaja, very much. Now I'm slowly going to move towards Latin American Caribbean region and I'm going to start with Alexandra. So Alexandra is a sex and gender consultant with trans and um, trans migrant experience. She's the co-founder of El Para Trans Latinas program in San Francisco, California. She is the program director of La Juria Trans in Mexico City, a program dedicated to empowerment and visibility of trans and non-binary people, including trans and children of youth. So I'm going to ask you exactly similar questions that I had with my um, previous speakers. So what is the nature of anti-gender mobilizing in Latin American region and who are the main actors and where do they get their support from? I just realized I was muted. Thank you so much for having me. And I truly believe that the nature of anti-gender anti movements against trans and gender diverse groups in Latin America are machismo, patriarchy, transmisogyny, as well as the lack of education and dignified media representation. Um, I'm always observing that uh, we trans people are continuously uh, sensationalized by media outlets and in social networks as well. Um, for me, um, I've been staying uh, away from um, social networks since the beginning of the year because um, it is horrible to read uh, some of the articles to read some of the notes, to even go through some of the comments by the um, cis heteronormative uh, people in social networks. Um, eh, everywhere when there's a article or, or news about some trans identify person, um, there's attacks. There's attacks, and for example, when a trans woman um, in, in, in Latin America is murdered or victimized, victim of a violent crime, um, the media usually uh, re-victimizes these uh, uh, trans uh, sisters by misgendering them, by using their dead name, and then also, the comments of some of the people uh, reading these notes and commenting on it are, are dehumanizing. So I believe that this has a lot to do with how we uh, Latinx and, 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 and are, are culturally uh, um, uh, 
a force to accept uh, machismo as part of our culture, to accept patriarchy as part of our culture. Uh, and there's not uh, also, I, I blame a lot the media because there's not really uh, many media outlets that have dignified uh, trans uh, identify people representing us. Uh, usually they stereotype and stigmatize what transgender is. And I truly believe, I truly believe that the two worst enemies, transgender and non-binary identify individuals have in Latin America, um, and it was already mentioned, um, our religion and the biologist terps, the, those are the movements that are continuously um, um, attacking us, are continuously uh, vocal against the gender ideology. <laughs> um, they have a pretty hateful promoting narrative. Um, on one hand, the religious groups, especially the Catholics, uh, claim that the gender ideology is trying to destroy uh, families' uh, values and perverting children. And um, they organize, they have a big movement and, and they're pretty vocal about it. And, and, and uh, they have pages on social networks. They, they come um, call out for uh, the, the media when they organize. And, um, and then on the other hand, uh, transgender exclusionary radical feminists, mostly women in academ and academy, um, have a hateful agenda as well um, with their biologist uh, discourse and claiming um, that transgender uh, men and women are trying to erase feminist women. And they deny us the, the right to exist in, in society. Um, their discourse make us transgender identify individuals a sexual deviance with a pathology, um, claiming we're on a mission to destroy families as well, perverting children, and distorting the gender binary, who is the only thing they accept. Um, therefore, I believe that these are the mostly the, the our worst enemies in, 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 in Latin America. And uh, in your work and in your work with a lot of activists in your region and you know, observing their work, what have you found? What are the strategies used by gender and trans group, gender diverse and trans groups and organizations in addressing these oppositions? Like what tactics do they use? And if can you share in, if there are any really good success, um, success examples? Well, for example, um... I'm going to extend a little more um, on how the religious groups and the Terps uh, form these coalitions and organize marches and run tables, and they very involved in politics as well. Um, and um, we uh, here in Mexico City, trans groups, trans. Uh, human rights defenders of transgender identify individuals. Um, we have created uh, several um, online groups. Uh, I myself am part of a more than five different WhatsApp groups uh, here in Mexico City alone, created and they're national. Some of these are national as well. Um, they have, um, we have organized and created these groups to discuss these type of attacks. Um, uh, like I said, uh, we are also very vocal against uh, media misrepresentation. Um, and, and our main focus, I believe, is to protect our trans children and youth. As we know, the church and the TERFs and even society 
uh, in a cis heteronormative uh, way, they believe, they truly believe that we trans uh, uh, activists and trans people that are organized are uh, perverting children, are, are like, we are the ones that are making children to become trans. That's truly a reality here in Mexico. And for example, where I am. And um, so we are uh, com continuously um, defending um, our trans children and youth from these attacks, from these coalitions. Um, we also have formed uh, coalitions and when there's a march, like one of these uh, annual marches from the religious groups, we are present there. We form our contingents to also give visibility that we exist. And uh, to me it's a great honor because now we have uh, trans families coming to these marches and demonstrate to them that these trans children, trans youth are fully supported by their families. And, and, and um, for me, um, I think um, this work is not just because of, um, it's like, not, it's not a work for me, it's like a moral uh, a obligation, a responsibility. Um, so, um, of course, you know, sometimes um, there's division in our movement as well, and it's mostly due to political, private political agendas. But for the most part, we are pretty much organized. Yes. And just very briefly, can you also um, speak about if you see any opportunities as well as like really pressing challenges in, that is that are coming up in this recent past and that you anticipate in the nearest future to happen? Yeah, you know, um, even though we have some great uh, advances uh, here in Mexico when it comes to our human rights, uh, for example, um, out of 32 states, uh, 19 of them had passed the gender identity laws. Um, only one of these states um, covers transgender children from five years on. And we also have um, supposedly um, human rights uh, laws that protect us um, against uh, discrimination. But there's a lot of work that we still have to do. Uh, we have two clinics that provide medical services here in Mexico City. They provide uh, HRT and mental health services. But in my opinion, we do have um, we do have a lot of work um, to do, even though we have some support by the, the system. Um, we have trans women also uh, representing us in Mexican Congress. Uh, we have shelters that provide a safe place for transgender people. Uh, we have become very visible in social networks and in the artwork, uh, but we are still challenged in academy and um, there are some trans people without access to education, especially in rural areas. And we are still challenged in the uh, um, um, workforce. You know, there's um, many, many trans identified individuals uh, unemployed. And um, my concern also as a trans uh, adult, um, a mature adult, um, is that many of my trans sisters and brothers um, are still living in extreme poverty and trans migrants as well are faced with many challenges and, and a cease normative system that rejects them and prohibits them from having uh, mobility. And as long as my sisters and brothers are still getting murdered and victimized, I believe there's a lot more work that still needs to be done here in my region. Definitely. Thank you, Alexandra, very much. Thank you for sharing all of this. And it's 
among all the alarming things that are happening, it's also it was also nice to hear that there, was, there are also some positive developments happening in the region. So mm -hmm. finally, I'm going to move to Alexis, which is uh, going to represent the context in the Caribbean context. So Alexis is the human rights defender from the Bahamas, and she's the executive director of UC Trans, which is United Caribbean trans organization. So Alexis, I'm going to start with exactly the same questions with you. How would you describe anti-gender mobilizing in opposition in your region who are the main actors? And where do you see they're getting their funding and other type of also ideological support from? Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about the Caribbean context when we talk about anti-gender movements. It's quite different, but similar to that of Mrs. Fisher in Africa, where we have these patriarchal systems and we have these um, religious institutions that fuel this anti-gender movement within the Caribbean region. So I would say for us, the main issue comes, the main persons who create and fuel this comes from pro-family groups, persons who believe that we are destroying the fabric of family within the Caribbean region. Um, they use their um, similarities. Oh, we are going to erase nuclear families. Like we're some phenomenon. So these persons are religious actors. These persons are persons who believe in pro-life agendas, persons who don't believe in sexual health and reproductive um, issues. These persons are religious, fanatics. I can't stress this as much, as much because this is where it's fueled from the church. It's fueled from Christianity. It's fueled from this biblical context of how we are to protect human life, how we are to protect um, male, female, this binary term that most people are used to. So we'll also see that women's groups play a part of this, um, especially when it comes to high political women's groups who um, infiltrate in the Caribbean region and take up space in um, the UN. They take up space in the OAS. They take up space in a lot of the decision-making spaces where it's infiltrated through our communities and to our communities. But the pro-family groups are the main ones and the religious institutions are the main ones that spew this type of hate towards um, trans and LGBTI people. Um, some of the main actors, like I said, are even Ministry of, of um, State. The state is one of the main actors coming out of the departments of Ministry of Gender Affairs. These people have not yet recognized the existence of trans citizens or the existence and diversity of human beings. Their focus within the ministry is basically binary contexts, protecting women and girls, not including um, trans communities as it relates to gender-based violence this is a perfect example. So some of these actors are persons within the state whose duty is to protect all citizens, um, excluding them from programs that would assist in helping with the gender move movement and, and the countries in the Caribbean region understanding gender. Again, there is this misconception and there's a lack of information as it relates to what is the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity. So there is mass, mis there's mass confusion as it relates to citizens within the Caribbean region. Um, another actors we have is Gongos, government organized NGOs who go to these platforms, who go to these regional meetings and who try to derail the agenda of human rights for all citizens, but they say they represent Caribbean regions and Caribbean citizens. So gongos are also a part of that. Pro-family groups, like I say, who sit at the hierarchy level, who sit in these decision-making spaces are also some of the main actors that cause the anti-gender movement to rise. Um, and can you also speak a, bit, a little bit, bit about what are the main tactics that, that these anti-gender groups are using against trans and gender diverse groups? Like, are they physical attacks or any, anything else that you have not mentioned in the, in, while answering the first question? Well, the, the, tactics, the tactics they use, they infiltrate it through youth, protecting our youth, protecting our young people. Um, religion. Religion is the priority in the country. Oh, you must be saved. You must be born again. You cannot live this lifestyle. Um, it's sinful. It's this, it's that. 
They use these things of guilt and shame um, to attack LGBTI citizens within the region. And the issue is, is because where Christianity and where religion is so dominant in the region, people are falling victim to this. But there's been an awakening. There's been an awakening, awakening of people realizing that their sexual orientation and their gender identity has nothing to do with their faith. But the tactics being used are those pro-life family groups who infiltrate our young people, who infiltrate churches and church youth spaces that are now becoming more visible. They've been visible, but they're becoming more visible because of the funding and the support that they get from their congregations, from family members who fear that their children may become LGBTI. So that community itself has its support to be able to talk about these issues on a public forum platform um, that the tactics that miss of misinformation and they use social media as an influential tool. You would see their ads popping up. You would see them talking about conversion therapy. You don't have to be this way. You're not born this. So you see they use, they have the money and they have the resources to be able to infiltrate spaces where us poor poverty trans people or persons who are miseducated cannot access the correct information to their true rights and their true identity. So those are some of the tactics that they use. Mm -hmm. And then Alexis, can you also share your observations in, on how trans and gender diverse groups have opposed, have resisted this opposition, and if there are any success stories that, success tactics that have worked? I think it's through the visibility of trans Caribbean citizens and LGBTI citizens that we have combated these persons, especially on the government level, because they would go into spaces and say that, oh, we don't have these types of people in our country. We don't have trans people in the Caribbean. We don't have trans people, um, LGBTI people in the Caribbean. So I think for us, our visibility is what created us to combat these types of groups. Um, persons who are a part of churches, they became visible and stood up in congregations in the region and say, I am a trans citizen and I am a person of faith. So I think them, um, the, 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 the combating of these types of groups is our visibility, ensuring that we are in spaces, ensuring that we are a part of the conversations, ensuring that we are rebuttaling and refuting statements that are made by religious organizations, that are made by government organized NGOs, that are made by state agencies as it relates to vulnerable communities in the Caribbean region. And the visibility is so important and that's why it's so important for funders to continue to fund um, grassroots NGOs, trans NGOs on the ground to be able to deal directly with the issues. I cannot go to um, sit with a government official to talk about gender identity if I don't have the proper clothing, if I don't have the resources or the language, or I don't have um, the, 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 the tools that I need in order to be effective with an effective communication. And I think we need to pay attention to that. How do we prepare our NGOs, our trans organizations to have conversations with um, government, political movements, to have conversations with um, women's groups, these are the types of things and we, we hate to believe it, but perception is everything. And if you don't have the jargon, if you don't know what the sustainable development goals are, if you don't know what it is, what human rights are, because that's the language the government understands. That's the language that the decision makers and the gatekeepers understand. So some of our combative tactics was learning about the SDGs, learning to speak the language of the government, changing the language to, to accommodate those decision makers and those political will leaders that will make the change for our communities. Yes. Yes. And finally, could you also speak a little bit about what, what do you see as some, some of the most um, salient opportunities as well as challenges that you see in the upcoming, um, in the nearest future? I think for us, taking care of ourselves as community, continuing to be the mothers, the fathers for our own communities, because we've been doing it before funding. And now that we have a little funding, we're able to do a little bit more because in the times past, in the Caribbean region, when a parent would throw their child out to the streets, it's the trans mothers or the drag fathers or the trans fathers who would take care of community. Community was always taking care of themselves. So I think what it is, is con continuing to take care of our community, 
with the little that we do have, but there's more work that needs to be done. And if we can get the funding to assist our community, such as safe houses, safe spaces, with a parent throw or trans person out, we have the opportunity or the resources to put them back in school, to be able to pay for the lunch, to be able to buy the books, to be able to continue the examinations. So this is what I see us moving forward as a region, continuing to do what we've been doing without the funding, but now with the injection of funding being very programmatic and very specific to the practical solutions of these communities. And I think for us, a lot of talk has been going on in the region, just talk with this needs to be action and it has to be centered by the community leaders. It has to be centered by the community itself. The trans community knows the needs, they know exactly what they need to be done. Again, some of the challenges is not being able to be in spaces. If we have the opportunity to be in these spaces, such as the pro-family groups are in, such as at the governmental level, such as at the OAS, which we do have some funding to be able to go to these spaces, but we need to be able to access the spaces where these pro-anti-gender groups are infiltrating, where their voices are being heard at a political level and at a decision-making level, we need to be able to combat that and infiltrate those spaces and say, we are here and we exist. And we are living examples of what our life is like. It's not to derail the pro-family movement, but we are here to derail your agenda of de 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 um, de not making stigma and discrimination against us as citizens of a country. And I think that's the most important language we need to be able to speak, that the country belongs to every citizen and every resident, and they deserve the same rights. And I think our message has to be very clear, direct, and deliberate. Thank you so much, Alexis. Couldn't agree more with your words. Um, as far as I know, there are no questions at this point. So I do hope that the discussions and the, the expertise that was shared by our panelists was really informative and helpful for activists all around the world, especially in, in, this, in these regions. And as I said in the beginning, when Gated will host a series of webinars that will be dedicated to these issues from different angles and from different regional perspectives. So keep an eye on our social media. Thank you each and every one of you um, who attended this webinar. Thank you, our panelists, for your ex sharing your expertise. And so this is, um, yeah, we're going to end the webinar. Thank you again, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for you having us. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye.